Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to the show. I guess I should tell you a little bit about myself since we just met. I have uh, lost some hair. Can you guys see me? Yeah. <laughs> Originally a crew cut. Um, unfortunately, most of the crew jumped ship. <laughs> Anybody know the medical term? It's hair peninsula. Can you? <laughs> Anybody from Florida? This make you homesick? This, um... Little vein running up and down there like Interstate 95, can you? You know what my big fear is? It's gonna break off and just be a little hair island. <laughs> I'm gonna have to grow it long, take a brush, make a little bridge out to it. <laughs> Windy days be a draw bridge. It's, um, <laughs> I am uh, 65 years old. I, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I, um, I saw my doctor recently, had a physical. I'm in good shape. However, he decided because we have a family history of high cholesterol, he put me on a high fiber diet. Are you familiar with a high fiber diet? <laughs> Which is fine. However, back home where I live, I have a low flow toilet. <laughs> Are you feeling me, middle agers? <laughs> Every morning it's a gamble. It's like playing potty poker. I'm down there on my hands and knees on the cold tile, cheering on a straight flush. Come on! Daddy needs low LDLs. Come on! You know the interesting thing about that joke? Everybody over 50 gets it. Everybody under 50 stares at me like a cocker spaniel with a New York Times crossword puzzle. 65 years old, been doing stand-up comedy 35 years, which means I have at least one, do you know, ex-wife. <laughs> I'm afraid it's an occupational hazard. Not gonna do like a lot of comedians do and run my first wife down. She is a wonderful woman. We just, uh, she's my high school sweetheart, my college sweetheart. We got married and realized a little bit too late we had absolutely nothing in common. But you guys know what they say, opposites. Yep, she was pregnant. I wasn't. So, <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's not true. I made that up. We, we never had any kids. I think that's probably a good thing. But uh, no, she and she went on to get married, have two kids, which is exactly what she wanted. I couldn't be happier for. I, um, I work, I work uh, conventions. I, I, do you guys know this? Every industry has a favorite joke, an inside the ballpark sort of I was doing the North Dakota grain dealers, <laughs> speaking of fiber, and yeah, have you been to North Dakota? Good people, hardworking, taxpaying, church going, little heavily Caucasian. <laughs> I had trouble finding black licorice. Um, yeah, I said that during my show and the meeting planner, oh my, she was mad. She came up afterwards, she did as my mama would say, she had a fit and fell in it. <laughs> she goes, Mr. King, I'll have you know, we have people here in North Dakota of several races. I said, yes ma'am, Anglos and Saxons. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the grain dealer's favorite joke is this, there's a guy working a combine, he's harvesting wheat and he has an accident and he gets his right arm cut off. That's the bad news. The good news is the doctor's able to reattach it. And he sees a friend of his downtown about six weeks later and the guy goes, dude, I heard you got your arm cut off in a combine accident, but the doc sewed it back on. How'd the operation turn out? Great. <laughs> I did a group of morticians. Dark sense of humor, oh my Lord. Yes, the selected independent funeral homes and I was speaking to the meeting planner a month before the, the talk, it was a motivational talk. And she said to me, what do you call your motivational speech for morticians? Now bear in mind, I was kidding. I said, I call it thinking inside the box. <laughs> yeah, they liked it so much I had to call it that. I'm telling you, they have the dark, here's their favorite joke. What's the most difficult thing about being a mortician? Do you know? trying to look sad at a $35,000 funeral. <laughs> That's just wrong. But if you've ever been in sales, you know what, 
<laughs> My favorite are the chiropractors. Anybody here a chiropractor? Anybody? Okay. How many chiropractors does it take to screw in a light bulb? One, but it's gonna take six visits. <laughs> if you've ever been to a chiropractor, you know that's the truth. And I work cruises. Anybody here been on a cruise? Have you done the cruise thing? Yeah. Okay, did you know this? The longer the cruise, the older the passenger. The longer the cruise, the older the passenger. I recently did 10 days on a 115 day cruise. 115 days. We're talking old people and their parents. <laughs> Every night, same thing for dessert, oxygen. <sighs> Oh, yeah. Heard it once, heard half a dozen times. Clear. Boom. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, helicopters coming and going from that boat like bees from a hive. I did a show in an 800-seat theater. It was packed. I called my wife from the port the next day. Honey, there was so much white hair in that theater, it looked like a Q-tip convention. <laughs> oh, on that cruise, because I talk to the audience oftentimes on the cruise, I call it comedy and conversation. I said to the audience, anybody here a mortician? After I did the mortician story, guy in the balcony raised his hand. I go, what is your name, sir? He said, Musgrove. I said, M-U-S-G-R-O-V-E? He goes, yeah. I said, well, coincidentally, Mr. Musgrove, in my town where I live, there's half a dozen Musgrove mortuaries. He goes, those are mine. So I said to him, so, What's the mortician doing on a 115-day world cruise? He stands up and goes like this. Inventory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why I talk to the audience. Exactly. People oftentimes ask me, no, did you do anything? Have you had any other jobs besides comedy? My first six years out of college, I sold insurance. It's a great business, but not really for me. And then I began to do stand-up comedy. I started comedy April Fool's Day, 1984, open mic night. And, let's see, 84? Yes, 84. And by December of 85, it was time for me to go on the road professionally. So I said to my girlfriend, now my wife, you want to go on the road? Just come along for the ride? And thinking she'd go, well, heck no. And she goes, yeah. So we were on the road together, 2,629 nights in a row nonstop. <laughs> Seven years and change. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Worked with Seinfeld and Dennis Miller and Ellen DeGeneres and Rosie O'Donnell and, and Foxworthy and Ron White. Anyway, the, uh, and played. Not, not all the clubs are quite this nice. There's a lot of beer bars, pool halls, and honky-tonks with drunk idiots screaming, tell us some jokes we can dance to. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here comes a slow one. You can slow dance. <laughs> yeah. And I got it. The reason we came off the road after seven years and change was I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina originally. And... A radio station, the number one morning show in Raleigh, it was a rock station, they needed a co-host and they asked me if I would be the co-host on the morning show. And I said I'd be delighted, so I, I, I did the morning show. And it was number one when I got there. Um, 18 months later, it was number six. Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine said, you didn't just drive that in the ground, you drove that in the middle earth. <laughs> well, you know why I got fired? It wasn't the ratings, it was a, a segment I used to do on the show called Too Stupid to Live. <laughs> Yeah, it's not about people who deserve to die. It's about people who, when you meet them, and I know you've met people like this, you wonder how they've lived as long as they have. <laughs> Example, a couple of months ago, two guys in Indianapolis attempted to rob a gun store at knife point. <laughs> do, do I need to tell you how that came out? And it wasn't just any gun store. The article in USA Today said the name of the gun store, A Thousand Guns. <laughs> what are the odds the owner's packing one? <laughs> now, I could have gotten away with that because I would be making fun of people in other places than Raleigh, North Carolina. But the people I made fun of were the employees of local businesses I had bumped into the day before. <laughs> and I could have gotten away with that, but they were sponsors' businesses. <laughs> And I could have gotten away with that, but I gave the name of the business and location the person I talked to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll take bite the hand to feed you for a thousand, Alex. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, uh, 
couple of my favorite stories. I'm in a Kroger. Uh, you guys have Kroger at the grocery stores? Yep. Yeah, pretty much nationwide. They own every grocery store I'm aware of. And uh, anyway, I'm in the express lane. And here's my philosophy on express lanes, although you didn't ask. I believe if you're in line behind somebody who has more than the number of items mandated by the sign above, it should be your privilege by law to decide what of theirs goes back to the shelf. <laughs> And I would advise playing hardball. I wouldn't send back the People magazine, the Slim Jim. I'd send back the K.O. Pectate and the toilet paper. Yeah. Make him think twice about doing that again. So I'm in the express lane, and bless his heart. By the way, that's a Southern expression. Do you know that? Yes. You can say anything you want about anybody you want in the South as long as you follow it. Bless his heart. <laughs> oh, honey, he's dumb as a bag of hammers. Bless his heart. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she is uglier than homemade soap. Bless her heart. <laughs> Do you know Earl Pauline's boy, or Pauline's boy Earl, dope smoking, drug dealing, toad licking, mobile home dwelling, redneck? Bless his heart. Uh, so the kid behind the register, and I've been him. I've been an 18 year old young man, and you can tell he doesn't care. He doesn't care. You know, he's there working to make enough money to buy a car and clear a sale. I've been there. <laughs> But the managers told him undoubtedly, every person comes to your register, you've got to say, welcome to Kroger, how are you? So he's going through the motion. Boop, welcome to Kroger, how are you? <laughs> Boop, welcome to Kroger. And I'm actually adding energy to the impression. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the kid would have to kick it up a notch to be a slacker. Anyway, <laughs> he gets to me and he goes, welcome to Kroger, how are you? I said, well, tell you the truth, I got a great big giant wedgie, how about you? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> no indication the word wedgie doesn't come up a half a dozen times a day in conversation. I will tell you this, the three people in line behind me are now paying attention. <laughs> yeah, I hand him my two apples. That was my snack. And by the way, when you're doing morning radio and you're responsible for comedy, think about this. My job was 12 minutes of family, friendly, funny every day. That's 60 minutes a week of clean, I mean, it is difficult to write, so I'm always looking for comedy. So I handed him my two apples, and he said this. Will there be anything else? Gave me the opening I was looking for. <laughs> I said, no, sir. Uh, as a matter of fact, those two apples you're holding, I don't want those. I want everything else in the, in the Kroger. <laughs> Every, and he freezes. He's vapor locked. <laughs> 30 seconds later, he comes around and he goes, uh, I'm sorry, sir. This, this lane is 10 items or less. <laughs> Apparently during the 30 seconds, he was counting the items in the store. <laughs> he at 11, he knows I'm in the wrong line. <laughs> well, the manager of the store called the manager of the radio station who called me on the carpet, a well-worn path, I assure you. Okay, the one that cost me my job, there was a Texaco station right next to the radio station, a Texaco Mini Mart, which is pumps on either side, convenience store in the middle. Again, I'm pumping gas, looking for comedy. And there's what I'm looking for on top of the pump is a, in a metal frame, they call them pump topper advertisements, is a, what looks like a giant Texaco credit card. They took a regular size credit card, they photoshopped it big, they stuck it in a frame, and it looks exactly like the real thing. Colors are correct, name, number, except in the lower right-hand corner, it says this, not negotiable. Okay, here's my feeling on this, although you didn't ask. If you can get the clerk to accept a three foot by two foot cardboard credit card replica, <laughs> you deserve the gas for free. <laughs> so you know what I did? I popped it off the frame, put it behind my back, <laughs> walked inside. Now, what I didn't know then, I do know now, it was his second day on the job. <laughs> Meaning A, he doesn't know much, B, he's aiming to please. So he goes, uh, that'd be $15 for the premium unleaded. I said, yeah, well, put her on this. <laughs> to my surprise and delight, he picks it up. <laughs> he's looking it over. I'm thinking, he's going to take it. Six bag of beer, bag of Doritos, quarter oil. <laughs> After about 30 seconds, he goes, hey, I can't take this as if there was ever any doubt. <laughs> Gets better. I can't take this, Mr. Doe. <laughs> I said, no, no, I come here all the time. You can call me John. <laughs> the 
goes, well, I can't take this. John, I go, why not? He goes, look here, she's done expired. <laughs> manager of the Texaco, called the manager of the radio station. Yeah, you know the drill. <laughs> My favorite convention, bar none, is when I was working at the radio station, I got a call from the North Carolina Wildlife Club. North Carolina Wildlife Club. They're like, they're like ducks unlimited for deer. Deer hunting is their big thing. So I go to the cocktail party before the event, you know, just soak up the ambiance, get a feel for the crowd, the group. And I kept hearing this expression. I kept hearing people say, the sport of deer hunting, the sport. So I threw out my first joke, whatever it had been. And I said to them when I opened up, you guys uh, think deer hunting's a sport? They're all nodding yes. I go, okay, all right, I'll bite. Now, name me one, just one, other sport where your opponent has no idea he's playing. <laughs> I mean, until the opening gun goes off, the deer has no idea he won the coin toss and elected to receive. <laughs> it's 0-1 before he knew what hit him. I said, I can understand it being a sport if by state law, you had to chase the deer down, tackle him, and choke him out, you know? It's a little hand-to-hoof combat. <laughs> now, when I was a kid, it was an outdoor recreational activity. It wasn't a sport. Here's something else that's changed. Nowadays, when I was a kid, you didn't have to wear orange in the woods. Nowadays, you have to wear a certain amount of orange if you're hunting in the woods. And I knew exactly why, but I asked the audience, hoping for just the right response, and I got it. How come you gotta wear orange? Some Yahoo in the back yells out, so another hunter will not mistake you for a deer. <laughs> I said, so let me get this straight. Here in North Carolina, we're selling guns and ammunition to human beings who lack the ability to distinguish other human beings <laughs> from deer. I, I said, forgive me, but couldn't we clear this up with something simple like, I don't know, a leg count? <laughs> I, here's my philosophy, I said. If you find me in the woods on all fours, shoot me. <laughs> I said, we don't need a gun when you buy a weapon in North Carolina. We need an IQ test. <laughs> I said, I got an idea. We'll do it like the cops. We'll have a photo lineup. Yeah, a bunch of deer and a guy. <laughs> and I'll make it easy. Famous deer, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Dancer. <laughs> you can't pick out that guy. No gun for you, Elmer Fudd. <laughs> now, if you hunt, you know we're making fun of this, but in the United States, every year, some somebody mistakes another somebody for a deer and plugs them. Happened last year in Georgia. The good news is the guy got, got, he just got wings, two stitches, he's fine. But he lived outside Atlanta. He was out behind his house, minding his own business. Okay, picture this, pruning in a tree. <laughs> I just wish I could have been in the woods with the two guys hunting right before the one guy pulled the trigger just to hear the conversation that led up to it. I'm guessing it went something like this. Hold my beer. <laughs> Why? I think I see a deer. <laughs> Where? On that ladder. <laughs> What's he doing? Looks like yard work. Boom! <laughs> now, the only other thing that's changed in the intervening years I'm working a Holland America ship and there's a woman from Tennessee and we're chatting and her son, when I, we were a kid, when I was hunting, we didn't have chemicals you could use to enhance the chance of bagging a buck. You guys know that? Her son hired scientists to manufacture, to duplicate the, the, the uh, scent that female deer give off when they're ready to procreate. And they put an aerosol spray can, which is why I love America. <laughs> yeah, no cure for cancer yet. <laughs> but we have fake deer hormone in an aerosol can. <laughs> and, and the guy sent me a case of it. And I'm reading the label and it says, attracts the buck, which by the way, turns out it does. <laughs> what it does not say, what I believe should be a federally mandated warning on each and every can, caution, this is a concentrate. It will not only attract the buck, it will send him into a romantic frenzy. <laughs> now, I've never used this, but if you're a deer hunter, correct me if I'm wrong, you spray this stuff around where you're waiting on the deer, 
And I'm assuming you hope you kill him with the first shot. Because I got news for you. If I shoot and miss, I'm seriously considering using that second round on myself. I don't think after Rudolph gets a face full of this Afro Deerziak, that big boy's gonna take no for an answer. I, I don't think the buck stops here. I don't think that's the case. Well, I told you guys I was on the road for 2,629 nights in a row nonstop. That's what the screen is about. For some strange reason, when I first went on the road, I started taking pictures. Do you remember the old cameras, the disposable? <laughs> I would take it with a disposable camera, then turn them into slides. I bought an old carousel projector. You remember the old carousel? And, and one night, for some reason, the club had a screen. I thought, I'll do my slideshow. And it was a hit. The manager said, Frank, I don't want to tell you how to run your life, but I do that slideshow every night. So these are slides that I, photographs that I took. If, if you've seen them on the web, it's, that, these are mine. I mean, I took them myself on that seven-year trip. So anyway, let's see. Oh, people always ask me what your first comedy routine was. That's from high school, from the high school yearbook. Why I'm dressed like an IHOP manager, I have no idea. <laughs> Remember the selected independent funeral homes? Remember I told you I had to call it thinking inside the box? That was the first slide in that motivational speech. And what I do when I do something like that, a motivational speech or whatever, I try to find slides in my collection that fit the theme, funeral home, graveyard, you know, just, and oftentimes I can find things that make sense to the people in the audience. For example, uh, historic life-saving station, cemetery. <laughs> Apparently not everybody makes it. <laughs> Drive carefully, we have two cemeteries, no hospital. <laughs> Secretary dead in. Yeah. Now, if you've seen that picture online, th I took this photograph in Wichita, Kansas in 1989, so that's mine. So, uh, now, I love epitaphs, you know, tombstones. If I'm someplace and I got time, I go to the city cemetery and I, I cruise up and down the, you know, the rows and see if I can't find, because sometimes people have a sense of humor when they put, you know, the epitaph. Anyway, here we go. Uh, Ma loves Pa, Pa loves women, Ma caught Pa with two in swimming, here lies Pa. <laughs> And the hand of cards, by the way, is aces and eights, which is dead man's hand, yeah. yeah. Yep. I told you I was sick. So I'm doing a, I'm doing a cruise, I'm down in Puerto Vallarta, and we got two days there, we stayed overnight. So I went to the city cemetery in Puerto Vallarta, cruised up and down the aisles. I've, I've been practicing my Spanish, so I found ones in Spanish that I thought were funny. I translated them to English, here they are. Tomas Chinchilla, rest in peace. Now you're in the Lord's arms. Lord, watch your wallet. <laughs> Gustavo Guzman, rest in peace. And memory from all of your sons except Ricardo, who didn't pay any money. <laughs> and Gracia Juvenales, he was a good husband, a wonderful father, but a bad electrician. <laughs> Yeah, I was in uh, Canada, and I, uh, one, of the, one of the passengers took a photograph and gave this to me. I, and it, I, well, you'll have to say it, so. Bunch of funeral services, grab them, bag them, burn them. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah I, I can't read that out loud. Uh, small print. Oh, tragedy in eastern Canada. Canada's worst air disaster occurred earlier today when a Cessna 152, a small two-seater plane, crashed into a cemetery early this morning in central Newfoundland. Newfie search and rescue workers have recovered 826 bodies so far <laughs> and expect an unmarked climb as the digging continues into the evening. <laughs> yep. That's my girl Chelsea. Yep, she's our first German Shepherd. She's a doll baby. And uh, these... Uh, this is on our front gate. I can make it to the gate, yeah. The two houses on either side of us have been robbed. Nobody's ever even come in the yard. The UPS guy throws stuff over the fence. And I'll, I'll leave, you, <laughs> leave you with this. This is, this is why they don't come in the back gate. The dog has a gun and refuses to take his medication. <laughs> My name's Frank King. Y'all been a lot of fun. Thanks very much. <laughs>